Let's pray. Father in heaven, we do thank you for this beautiful Sabbath day that you've given us. We thank you for your presence here with us today, Lord. We ask that you would bless this service, bless these words, bless this communion service to you, Lord, to glorify and uplift you in our lives, Lord. We ask these things now in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Sabbath Church. Oh, this has been quite the week. Quite the week. What a mighty, awesome God we serve. Um, when I first heard this song, me and my wife was not feeling well today. She's under the weather every week now, it seems like. But when we first heard this song, Reckless Love of God, we didn't really care for it too much. We, it, as I began to listen to the words and, and kind of, and I went to the author and read what he was thinking when he wrote this song. And to an unbeliever, and I've heard people say, you know, I can't go to church. I'm too bad. And it may seem like God's love is reckless, but God, who invented love, is showing you his unconditional love and trying to get us to love as he loves everybody.
mountain you won't climb up coming after me there's no wall you won't kick down no lie you won't tear down coming after me Good morning. Good morning. Happy Sabbath. Amen. And I'll say again, it's a beautiful day. Amen. It's incredible. A little cold. It's going to be a lot colder. Some of us like that, and some of us aren't too sure about that. <laughs> but it is what we have. The title of my sermon this morning, and before I do that, I would like to have a prayer. Father in heaven, again, we thank you for each one of us being able to be here. We thank you for each one of us that have a part in the program, that you're there to bless the words that are shared and the actions, and that you'll give us uh, the peace of mind that we need to, to be able to deliver the words that we need to. Lord, we, we pray for a blessing now on this sermon, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 The title of the sermon, Digging Deep. As I was working on it, it kind of came to mind that I had probably heard a sermon entitled Digging Deep before, but I think it involved putting your hands in your pocket, putting your hands in your purse, and digging deep, and pulling out all the money that you can find in there. But I'm not going to do that today. But it did remind me that it should reinforce that we are still in a building program. Yes. We don't want to become complacent meeting here at the Unity Church, even though it's nice and it's warm in here today. Uh, but we don't want to get too comfortable. There's many programs that we cannot do because of our limited access to this building. So we need a place of our own We've been here without a permanent church for two and a half years. And time flies, whether you're having fun or not. Mm -hmm. The 10 days of prayer, as mentioned earlier, the 10 days of prayer and fasting have made our new church home a priority to pray for. We each, and I'm gonna leave this one kind of open to each one of us, but we each need to dig deep in whatever form that means to you, whether it's financially, whether it's praying, whether it's planning, we need to reach deep and to keep moving forward to find our permanent church home. Now today, moving on to the sermon, 
comes from the scripture comes from Philippians 1 6 it says for I am confident of this very thing that he who began a good work in you will perfect it until the day of Christ Jesus so this morning in talking about instead of talking about buildings I'm going to talk about gardening I don't know if your memories of gardening are good or bad. Hopefully most of us here have grown something. Even if it's just an avocado seed that never really grew into a tree, but it sprouted. We hope that it created a good memory of gardening, of planting the seed in the ground and watching it become a large plant that can bear good fruit and abundant fruit. And through the process, you probably experienced that gardening is not an easy job. Amen. You found out that sometimes it was successful and sometimes not. Now, your garden could have been something simple. I like simple. It could have been something simple like a patio garden where you have a tomato plant planted in a bucket. It's set on your patio, and that's your garden, and that's good. It gives you the experience of growing something. But no matter what type of garden you have, you know, you can go all the way up to a garden like what we have, and I think it's 2,500 square feet. But we generally don't do all of that in a garden at one time. But there's basic things no matter what size and how far you get into the garden that you have to do. Number one, you gotta clear the weeds. Number two, you gotta clear the weeds. <laughs> Number three, you gotta clear the weeds some more. At least in our garden. But no, seriously, you gotta clear the weeds, prepare the soil, plant the seeds, water the plants. Oop, you gotta pull the weeds again. But after all of that, and your garden is taking shape, and it's starting to come up, you've got to contend with the rabbits, the squirrels, the raccoons, the deer, the birds, and the bugs. And every last one of those critters think that you planted that garden just for them, <laughs> just for them to enjoy. They don't tell you thank you, they don't ask your permission, they just do it. Obviously, the bigger the garden, the more work you have to do. And it takes a lot of perseverance to be a gardener because of some of those weeds that you gotta pull. And you gotta pull them again and again. And you gotta chase the animals away. You gotta build a fence to keep them out. But you cannot just throw the seeds on unprepared soil and come back in 60 days and expect to have a bountiful harvest. It would be nice if it worked that way. Mm -hmm. There's a lot of time and effort must be invested to have a successful garden. The outcome of the work is unknown when you get started, but most gardeners, when they plant the seed, can see the final product in their mind. And a lot of times that's because they've looked at the back of the seed packet when they plant it, or the front of the seed packet, and it has a picture of the fruit that that, thing, that seed will grow into. Mm -hmm. Now sometimes that's the only thing you'll see from that plant <laughs> that year. But you will know what it's supposed to do. Now as the plants start to produce and the fruits of the labor can be seen, the gardener can take pride in those results. Look what's grown in my garden. Now, just a little story about our garden. We had planted some cantaloupe plants in the garden. And those are fairly easy to grow. And they grow everywhere. They don't just stay contained. They'll spread out over most of your garden if you let them. And that's what these vines did. They grew into good looking plants and they started putting on blooms, lots of blooms. From some of the blooms, little cantaloupe started forming. Some of these grew into very nice looking cantaloupes, kind that you really want to get and eat. But we watched them, and when we finally determined 
It was time to pick one of them. It was the best looking one there, of course. But when we picked it up, it was soft. But it looked pretty, just like you'd see in the grocery store. But when you picked it up, it was soft. So we turned it over and we looked at the bottom, and that cantaloupe was hollow. <laughs> a mouse, and it's hard to believe a mouse could get in there and eat all that, so maybe it was the whole family of mice got in there and they hollowed out the cantaloupe. But from the top of it where we saw it, it looked pretty. It looked nice. There are no guarantees in gardening. Right up to the harvest of that cantaloupe, it looked good. But things can go wrong. However, even with all the work and the uncertainty in planting a garden, people in general like to plant things and see them grow. That's the best part is when they do grow. Perhaps this desire to see things grow comes from our own humble beginnings and the very first perpetual job given to humanity. In Genesis 2, 7 and 8, we probably all know this, then the Lord God formed man of dust from the ground and breathed into his nostrils a breath of life, and man became a living being. The Lord God planted a garden toward the east in Eden, and there he placed the man whom he had formed. In Genesis 2.15, the, the Lord God took the man and put him into the garden of Eden to cultivate it and to keep it. Adam had the very first perpetual job in his world. And people are still continuing gardening today. Now since God formed us from the dust of the ground in his image and breathed the life of, breath of life into us, we have a strong connection to both the soil and to God. Perhaps that's why most gardeners will readily tell you that they find great satisfaction and benefit in being involved in their gardens, working the soil, the quiet time, away from everything else, just to contemplate the world and what's going on. Because even if you invite someone to come work in the garden with you, a family member or a neighbor, so you're out there by yourself, which is actually a good thing. Now, let me share an explanation of garden from the Andrew Study Bible. This explanation is associated with Genesis 2.8. The Hebrew term comes from root meaning to be enclosed, fenced off, and protected. The garden marks off a space where created order and harmony is visible. It's also a temple garden, which was later represented in the tabernacle. Both the tabernacle and the garden serve as a meeting place between God and humanity. And I mentioned contemplating just a couple of sentences ago. It's a good place to meet with God. You can just sit out there and pull all the weeds you want. You don't have to think about them. But you can pray. And you can think about things there. But let's go back to the garden now. The dust of the ground and the breath of life are two components that make up humanity. That combination makes us who we are. But once sin entered the picture and altered that image that we were created in, God has been constantly at work in humanity, working to bring his image back fully in us. Not an image that's marred by sin. That won't work for him. That, that is the plan of salvation a fully restored relationship with God. But going back to the garden again, this was the very first perpetual task given to mankind. We were supposed to work the soil and reap the benefits of the harvest. But over time, gardeners found out that it takes hard work to make a garden grow. It takes hard work to make a garden produce good fruit. In the summertime in Central Texas, it's sweaty, dirty, persistent, hard work. 
any way you go about it. Doesn't matter if you're out there early in the morning, late in the evening, it's still hot. Now I can't help but think about the gardening that God did during creation. And it's not so much uh, causing the plants and trees to grow. I'm talking about how he prepared the soil in order to produce good fruit and how he is still pre preparing the soil in order to produce good fruit. Now any master gardener knows much of the success of the harvest is dependent on the preparation of the soil. The more care and attention given to preparation, the better the harvest. Because we were created from the soil, it's not much of a stretch to picture God as being the master gardener. Now picture yourself, if you've ever enjoyed gardening at all, you can picture yourself with your hands in the dirt as you prepare the soil for some plant or seed that you want to plant. You know that the soil preparation is key. You spend a significant amount of time turning the soil over, pulling weeds, can't get away from those weeds. They're gonna be there from now on. But you make sure that the right amount of organic material is mixed in, maybe adding even a little fertilizer. These are things that require getting up close and personal with the soil. You kind of get down on your knees and you start working that stuff in. This is hands-on, what they would call hands-on attention to the details. Now you picture God digging his hands into the soil, contemplating how he's going to go about preparing this soil for a harvest that's so spectacular the universe has never seen anything like it ever before. It's a one-of-a-kind harvest. For the human gardener, the soil prep time may take several months. But for a master gardener like God, that soil preparation takes lifetimes. In fact, it takes the lifetimes of everyone who has ever lived and who will ever live on this earth until the day of Jesus' return. Our lives, the span of time from the day we're born to the day we die, is soil preparation time for God. And you can believe that God wants a bountiful harvest. 2 Peter 3, 9. The Lord is not slow about his promise, as some count slowness, but is patient towards you, not wishing for any to perish, but for all to come to repentance. He wants all to be there. And just like every gardener has their own secrets for soil prep, mostly depending on the differences in the soil they're preparing, it's much the same with us. Each of us is like a very unique garden. Some of us have more weeds. Some of us have more briars stinky things that poke you. Some have more rocks. Some have all clay. It's just not necessarily good things to work with. But right now, the, the garden of our character, and that's what he's building is our character. That is a product of the garden that he has planted. It may not be much to look at now, but God is always at work in the dirt, preparing the soil so the seeds of his truth and his image can take root, so that the seeds of his truth and his image can take root and grow in us to an abundant harvest. Now, how do you even know if God is working in your garden? So we all just go through life day in, day out. Maybe the number one thing is everyone that's sitting here, God is working in their garden. At some point there was a seed planted that said that I need to be in church. And this is the fruit of that. Now, possibly you feel a desire to pray for others. That's 
extra seed that can be planted. You feel a desire to be a servant like Jesus was. Another seed. You feel a desire to be a Sabbath school teacher. No takers on that one? I was going to say, Glenn, take down her name if they held up their hand. How many of us would want that seed planted to be a Sabbath school teacher? And that's okay. The seeds can be planted, they can germinate, or they cannot germinate. Um, all of the seeds have the potential of developing our character. Some of these seeds, again, will germinate and develop into great things. Or they may not. <clears throat> Similar to our cantaloupe. It looked good, but it, it wasn't something that you could do anything with. What they can become may depend on how we nurture them as they grow, how we tend to them, the interest that we show in, in taking care of those seeds to help them grow. Being at church like this helps a lot of different seeds to grow. Just conversations that we have with each other. It's that conversation that, that fertilizes that seed, if you would. It helps it to grow. And we don't even know it, but that person where that seed is growing knows it. Now, just like a gardener can look at the soil of a well-prepared garden plot, Freshly planted with seeds, he can see a potential for a great harvest. And when God looks at us, even as he's involved in the process of soil preparation, he sees the finished product, even though we don't know what that is. Mm -hmm. After all, we see what's in front of us. We don't know what it's going to be like at the end. Now, we are given a small picture in Scripture in 1 Corinthians 15, 51 to 54. It says, Behold, I tell you a mystery. We're not all asleep, but we will all be changed in a moment in the twinkling of an eye. And that's a very quick change. Twinkling of an eye. At the last trumpet, for the trumpet will sound, and the dead will be raised, imperishable, and we will be changed. For this perishable must put on the imperishable, and this mortal put, must put on immortality. But when this perishable will have put on the imperishable, and this mortal will have put on immortality, then will come about the saying that is written, death is swallowed up in victory. No more death. No more death. That's the harvest that God sees even now. He sees it as though it's already accomplished, but obviously for us, it's still, that harvest is still to be seen. Now, a very comforting thought about this harvest that's very different than any other harvest that any other gardener has ever worked for is that this harvest is guaranteed. It will happen. It's not dependent as regular gardening on the weather whether it rains or whether it shines, the sun shines, whether it freezes, whether it hails, or whether a hurricane comes through, it's not dependent on that. About the only thing it's really dependent on is that the gardener, the gardener with the capital G, mm -hmm. is actively involved in the growing, our growing process. Now for a gardener like us, that means that it's dirt on our hands, our knees, our shoes, and I know how my hands and knees look after I've been out in the garden for only an hour, yet he's doing this for lifetimes. I can't, can't quite picture that. For a gardener like God, though, getting his hands dirty in a growing process means something else entirely. Now, Going back to what I just said is, I have to admit that all through the preparation of this sermon, that I was conflicted about my God, the God of the universe, 
getting his hands dirty because of us. But he did speak the day and the night into existence. Don't think he got his hands dirty. He spoke the dry land into existence. Again, I don't think he got his hands dirty. He spoke that. He spoke the grasses and the trees into existence. I don't think he got his hands dirty there either. But when it came to man, God formed him from the dust of the ground, shaping man in his own image, which kind of leads you to believe that he got his hands dirty doing that. In verse 8, God planted a garden for Adam. He says he planted a garden, which did he get in there and dig the plants in? Did he cultivate them? Did he fertilize them? You know, what did he do? What did planting mean to him? Now, the garden is different than the trees and the grasses that he planted throughout the world. Now, the other thing that kind of I tied in with this is in Genesis 3.8, it says they heard the sound of the Lord God walking in the garden in the cool of the day. So if he was walking in the garden, could he have been there to teach them how to cultivate, how to care for the plants? Could he have got his hands physically dirty at that point? We'll find out one of these days. We are told that anything, anything is possible with God. That extends to soil preparation for our garden also. After all, his goal is to be abundant harvest at the end. And he's willing to work with his hands to do that. Now God has always been in the process of preparing the soil for the harvest. When you come right down to our time, it does look a little something like what Paul states in 2 Corinthians 3.18. But we are all with unveiled face, beholding as in a mirror the glory of the Lord, are being transformed into the same image from glory to glory. As long as we choose to gaze or to look intently, into the glory of God and as we allow him to write his law in our hearts as we give him permission to make the changes that he sees fit to make and because we are a living garden our permission given to God is not a static thing it's not a one and done type of thing it is a permission given moment by moment day by day to cooperate with God as he seeks to transform our marred image back into his image. That's a picture of God as a master gardener being actively involved in the process of soil preparation. Now, this reminds me of a story that demonstrates the talents of a master gardener. Not the master gardener, but a master gardener here. A few years ago, a middle-aged man was riding his mountain bike on a trail near town. The path ran along a creek and passed by a fairly nondescript hillside, covered in your average scrub growth, lots of weeds, brambles, patches of dirt, and garbage blowing in the wind. He noticed a small sign that was posted nearby. And the sign read, this area has been adopted by the local Master Gardener Association. Now the following part of this account is in his words. So I'm gonna read what he said. I thought to myself, wow, what are they gonna do with this worthless piece of land? He passed judgment on that piece of land just in one sighting. Little did I realize the potential. I came back that way every now and then, and I'd see piles of mulch, piles of crushed granite, 
or just piles of dirt. It never looked very impressive. In fact, in times it looked even worse than it did before the master gardeners got involved with it. Sometime later, though, I rode past that same hillside again. But this time it was not a forlorn, forlorn hillside. It wasn't empty or desolate or anything negative. There were no piles of dirt, no piles of mulch, only a beautiful spread of the most perfect flowers, bunches of grasses, and pathways for easy access. It was incredible. I had to stop and make sure I was in the right place because I really didn't recognize it at all. And sure enough, it was the same field and the same hillside, just completely transformed into a new image. Now God can do, do to us the same thing that this Master Gardener Association did to that barren hillside. If we allow him, he will change our image or character, if you want to put that in there, back into the complete image and likeness of how he first created us. And he's doing so to reestablish that face-to-face -face relationship that began in a garden. Now make no mistake, God, as a master gardener, is preparing for a great harvest. The harvest that we're given just a small glimpse of in Revelation 7, 9, and 10. After these things I looked, and behold, a great multitude which no one could count. A great multitude which no one could count. That's a lot. From every nation and all tribes and peoples and tongues, standing before the throne and before the Lamb, clothed in white robes and palm branches were in their hands. And they cry out with a loud voice saying, Salvation to our God, who sits on the throne and to the Lamb. Now remember God, as the master gardener, is willing and is able to get his hands dirty, reshaping our lives, to bring us back into that image that he first created, his perfect image. You and I, we are his harvest. We look forward to that day with great longing. Let's pray. Father in heaven, as always, we thank you for this, this place, Lord, this church family that has come together this morning to draw strength and comfort from each other. Lord, we, we thank you for this image that you had created so many years ago that we can be drawn back to, Lord, and that we would be receive that image and be ready for this harvest that, that you will bring. Lord, we pray for comfort and wisdom and guidance through all the remaining days that we have, Lord. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 I will read I will read now uh, belief number 16 the Lord's Supper this is in number 16 out of 28 the Lord's Supper is a participation in the emblems of the body and blood of Jesus as an expression of faith in him, our Lord and Savior. In this experience of communion, Christ is present to meet and strengthen his people. As we partake, we joyfully proclaim the Lord's death until he comes again. Preparation for the supper includes self-examination, repentance, and confession. The master ordained the service of foot washing to signify renewed cleansing, to express a willingness to serve one another in Christ-like humility, and to unite our hearts in love. The communion service is open 
to all believing Christians. You don't have to be a member of the Bradford Church. All believing Christians are included. We're reading in John 13, 13 through 15, it says, You call me teacher and Lord, and you say, Well, for so I am. If I then, your Lord and teacher, have washed your feet, you also ought to wash one another's feet. For I have given an example that you should do as I have done to you. One of the beauties, one of the blessings of the SDF movement is that we follow Sola Scriptura. Amen. This is not a tradition of the Seventh-day Adventist Church. This is what Jesus Christ asks us to do. So the right to humility is an essential component of the communion because we humble our hearts by cleaning, washing the feet of our fellow brethren. Now is our time to go to the foot washing rite. Uh, men can gather at the room where the food is served, correct? And we invite our sisters to uh, gather at the where we serve the potlucks. And then after that, we will gather here to continue with our part of the communion. Okay, now that we participated in the rite of humility through the foot washing, it's now our time to do what Jesus asked. Do this in remembrance of me. Let's pray. <coughs> Dear Heavenly Father, thank you for the blessing of the communion. We know that we have to be in constant communion with you 24-7. We know that you are that gardener that is working in our characters for an eternal life. Your Lord, help us to cherish this moment. This is the first communion of the year. Help us to open our minds to your invitation day in and day out. And we always are always ready to be with you. Bless this service, because in Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen. Amen.
Dickens? I read from 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 23. For I received from the Lord that which I also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus on the same night in which he was betrayed took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, Take it. This is my body which is broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. It's it. In the same manner, <coughs> he also took the cup after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. These do as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. <coughs> Thank you. 
for as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you for giving us the opportunity to be here today. We know that uh, our brother Frank will have to be here, and same as Patricia, but yet she couldn't be here. So our heart goes to all of those that wanted to be here today in this communion for this service today, and they couldn't make it. Dear Lord, we ask you that you bless our minds in such a way that uh, we are not going to be also only staying with you on Sabbath, but the rest of the week. Let us join tonight to continue with these beautiful 10 days of prayer. Let's remember that this is a worldwide movement that we're praying for your soon coming. Now we ask you that you give us all travel mercies, that we can uh, have a rest, beautiful Sabbath, and that we can enjoy the rest of the week. Help us with the weather that is coming upon us and help those that are already suffering the consequences of this, this uh, natural disaster we have in the country. Because in Jesus' name I pray, amen. Amen. We stand for closing song. I sing the mighty power of God. <clears throat>